Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to EMC World 2015. That was a little bit, bit of a bigger drop than I'd rehearsed right there. So, welcome everybody. Uh, before we kick off the show for today, I just want to take you through the highlights of the program for Monday. Obviously, you can engage with us all the way through the show by following our Twitter hashtag, hash EMC World, and also downloading the app. In just moments, David Goulden is going to be kicking us off with his keynote around redefining next, or how organizations are beginning to digitize their businesses. He's gonna be joined by Praveen Akaraju, for the CEO from VCE, who we recently brought into the EMC Federation of Companies. And then we're gonna dive into a session with Jeremy Burton and Guy Churchwood on the Core Technologies Showcase. Now we have many special guests joining us at EMC World this year. And this morning, we're gonna be joined by Scott Harrison, founder and CEO, of Charity Water, many of you will have met Scott last year, and Guy Tamaro, Vice President of the Global Service Delivery Function at Xerox. Once you're out of the main session, the fun continues. You're able to go and check out our new guru sessions. The first guru session is gonna be big data as explained by the founders of Hadoop. So make sure you check that out on Monday today, today's Monday, at three o'clock in Venetian F. After that, there's a ton of stuff that's happening in the village. And outside of the general sessions, this is really the core experience for all of you. Inside the village, many, many things going on. You're able to go and check out the information generation. You may have heard this about our thought leadership campaign. You're able to check out the Solutions Expo. You're also able to check out the concerts on the common. We have a lot of music that's happening in there, not just the fantastic orchestra that we have right behind us. You're also able to see how customers are using technology from EMC. And you can see we really have a sport theme. So if you're interested in Major League Baseball, if you're interested in cycling, if you're interested in how sport is deployed on television, if you're interested in things like motorcycling or motor racing, lots of ways for you to engage with the customer showcases. We also are bringing a DevOps theme to EMC Well for the first time. Obviously, DevOps is becoming an increasingly uh, preferred way for organizations to live at IT. So come check out DevOps at EMC World with the Open at EMC program. We have a lot of content for all of you, and we've tried to separate this content into two tracks. A track for IT leadership, focusing more on strategy and directions, and a track on technology, getting deep and dirty with the technology. We know that this is why many of you come to EMC World. So there are more opportunities than ever to get educated, to maximize the investment that you've already made in EMC and learn something new about the technologies that we provide. So whether that be through the V Labs, the 31 self-paced or the 14 instructor labs, whether that be through the breakouts or the certifications that we're gonna be running, please take advantage of being here and learn as much as you can. Finally, I would just like to say thank you to our sponsors. Without our sponsors, EMC World would just not happen. So I'd like to say thank you so much to our diamond sponsors, to Brocade, to Cisco, and to CSC, to our platinum sponsors, Accenture, Atos, Capgemini, and Intel, and obviously to our gold sponsors and to our sponsors from across the Federation. I hope you have a fantastic show at EMC World. It's going to be a really, really great three or four days. So with that, let's get on with the show.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO, EMC, Information Infrastructure, David Goulden. MC World 2015. There are over 14,000 of us, believe it or not, from 99 different countries, not 100, 99 countries from around the world joining us today. So thank you for joining us all, spending a week with EMC at EMC World. We're really excited to have you here this week. We have some hugely important announcements. We think we're going to help us all be more successful in our careers as a result of what we're doing for you here today. And our theme that we've been going through for the last few years is a theme of transformation. And this year, the theme is redefine.next. And why? Because we think the pace of change in our industry isn't slowing down, it's actually accelerating. In 2020, which is only five years away from today, there'll be seven billion people connected to the internet. They'll be outnumbered by 30 billion connected devices, collectively producing 44 zettabytes of data a year, only five years away from today. And software will become the key enabler to create compelling outcomes out of this interconnected digital world. Now, you don't have to wait until 2020 for this to happen. There are many examples of this disruption occurring around us today. And software is not just about the killer app, it's also about enabling smart devices. So who would have thought that five years ago, we'd all be walking sensors with a Fitbit? And that'll become even more prevalent with the Apple Watch. Hands up who's ordered one already. And with the advances in nanotechnology, sensors can be embedded in just about anything. And this is just the start. Our world is changing. And most of us will interact with these smart devices and new apps through one of these. In fact, the smartphone is taking over most aspects of our everyday lives. So let me just step back and give you some examples that I think you can all equate to. So when I travel, I can't remember the last time I booked a ride in the city. With Uber, car available in five minutes or less. It's one of my favorite applications, it's right there on my smartphone all the time. When I'm away, I use Wink to manage what's going on at home. Because when I'm out, because homes are now online, they're part of the internet of things. And when we go out for a couple of hours, one of the most important things that I need to do is check upon our Dachshund, Fred. So I use the IVMS application to see what Fred's up to. Again, only for a couple of hours. So I check on Fred, here he is on the right-hand side. Looks like he's resting, but not too happy. So a few minutes time, I want to check on little Fred again, see what's going on. And this time you see he's relaxing again somewhere else in the house. Next time, he's guarding his toy collection. He likes to move around. Next time I take a look at him, he's sunbathing. And last but not least, he's a smart little guy, and he knows we're watching him. He also knows we try to teach him to hula hoop because we think having a Dachshund at hula hoops will be a good icebreaker at a party. So he's watching us, and you can see he's trying to convince us he's practicing his hula hoop. And as you can see, it's not going too well. So now I'm back in my car. I want to park in the city. So I use Lux to hand the car over to a valet whilst I go in to have an appointment. And on the way home, I use my smartphone to order a chef-cooked meal through Munchery for myself, Andrea, and of course for Fred, to be delivered when I arrive home. Simple example of a day in a life, or half a day in my life. So I'm sure you get the picture. And what's important about this picture is that, uh, is that we're not going back. We're not going back to where we used to be. We're only moving forward in this interconnected world. So this is not the first time our expectations have changed, and we've tended to name entire generations around these shifts in technology. So let's step back and think about that for a second. 
On the right-hand side here, first of all, the baby boomers. Well, the Filofax and the mobile phone, remember that big thing that you had the aerial that came out? The Filofax and the mobile phone were the points of inflection, technology inflection, for this generation. Then the Gen X went mobile, well, almost mobile, as Luggables became the first family of a new range of technologies that ultimately resulted in personal computers and the such like. Millennials went truly mobile with smartphones as we know them today, and we're even talking about post-millennial or Gen Z, where wearables and virtual reality becomes the norm. But we want to question with you today if any of these categories make sense anymore. And the good news is it doesn't matter which of these technology generations you're part of because you shouldn't feel left out. We're now all part of the information generation. So what are the characteristics of this new thing we're calling the information generation? Well, I described some of the experiences earlier, the day in the life of the consumer, but what do businesses need to do to thrive and meet the expectations of the information generation? Good question, we thought. So we went out to ask you, us and you. We thought we'd go and ask. We asked over 3,000 business leaders in 18 countries in 10 different industries around the world what they thought were the five most important attributes those businesses need to exhibit to thrive in the information generation. And here are those five. You can see them quite clearly on the screen. We then asked the same business leaders what were the relative importance today of each of these attributes. And two of them, as you can see, rose to the top, predictably spawning new opportunities and innovating in an agile way. Now, spawning opportunities is kind of obvious, but doing it predictably talks to things like analyzing big data in real time. Innovating in agile ways across the entire business talks the need for IT to be leading the transformation of business with software written in agile ways. The other dynamic at play here is that these are requirements coming from the business, and IT needs to step in and lead or be left behind. We then asked the same people how ready they thought their organizations were in each of these dimensions. And you can see from the red scores on here, the gaps are quite remarkable. Now, this is a big problem. And I can see you sitting, sitting there saying, well, that's interesting. Does this really matter? I can assure you it absolutely does. Here's an interesting data point. When these transitions have happened in the past, companies have gone out of business. Almost 90% of the fortune 500 in 1955 don't exist today. They were put out of business by disruptions in their industry. And we think this current transition is bigger than anything we've seen before. And this is being exclusively driven by a technology platform shift. This does matter. We've talked about this before. This technology platform shift is what we call the third platform of IT. The third platform is underpinned by these key technologies, these mega trends, cloud, mobile, big data, and social. But we should not be confused. These are purely enablers. By their own, they mean very little to the business. The key thing is the application of these technologies to deliver these attributes we talked about that will make companies successful in the third platform. So for example, Big data and analytics help predictably spot new opportunities. Cloud helps organizations innovate in agile ways. It's the application of these technologies to create these business attributes or outcomes which is going to lead to success in this new generation. Now, keeping the information generation happy and delivering a third platform business outcome is not easy for IT. It's going to create a huge pain point for the CIO, but success will enable growth for the business. And if life were this easy, we'd all be OK. But the truth of the matter is that we have thousands of apps, millions of systems that exist today that we're running the business, 
and most of us are faced with having to reduce costs in today's arena to fund growth in the new world, often supported by additional funding from the business, and last but not least, manage the risk in this new interconnected environment. And these together are the true pain points that CIOs, we believe, feel very much day in, day out when they're faced by these huge opportunities, but also huge pressures. So if we step back for a second, we've been thinking about this for quite some time. And these reasons and solving these pain points are exactly the rationale as to why we built the EMC Federation of Companies, Pivotal, VMware, and EMC Information Infrastructure, which I have the privilege to lead, which also includes VCE and RSA. And these businesses are strategically aligned but offer choice. And you're going to hear more about each of them this week. Today, we're going to go a little bit deeper into EMC information infrastructure. Now, by themselves, these federation companies offer great technology. But together, we believe we can deliver what you really need, which is simply an outcome. And we've been working on a number of outcomes, and we've built what we call engineered solutions across the Federation that can deliver real outcomes in a matter of just weeks. And of course, where many customers start in this journey with us, is on the, with us, is on the cost reduction side with their existing apps. And for this, we've developed an outcome we call the EMC Federation Enterprise Hybrid Cloud. Now, of course, you're also going to want a cloud architecture to run your new apps, albeit on slightly different infrastructure, because these new apps are different, as we'll talk about this week. But you want to think about the infrastructure for your new apps also as part of your enterprise hybrid cloud as well. Then what do you want to do next for building third platform apps for the new digital world based upon pivotal technology? And then for driving insights into business information, we have our business data lake, which can ingest data from new apps as well as key data from your existing apps. And last but not least, in this new environment where there are often a thousand times as many users, security is critical. And this is where RSA comes in with our security analytics solution. And you should think about security analytics as a security, as a as a data lake built for security, and security has now become a big data problem. So these are the key outcomes we've built based upon the Federation technology to help you solve these business problems, leveraging all of the technology inside of EMC in the bigger sense. So as I said, the most immediate opportunity for many of us in the audience today is to build a private cloud with off-ramps, with ramps to off-ramp clouds, or what we call the enterprise hybrid cloud. And via the work we've done to create an engineered solution, you can be up and running in as little as 28 days with an enterprise hybrid cloud inside your business. The technology foundation of the EHC is VMware virtualization and EMC storage. And as we'll talk later, we consider these not platform two, but platform 2.5 technologies. But infrastructure transformation is more than about just the technology. It's about the process automation layer, which is where a lot of the OPEX savings come from. And these are provided via the VMware vRealize suite. But the good news is it goes beyond that, because the enterprise hybrid cloud can be much more than just an infrastructure transformation experience. It can also be used as a platform for app rationalization and transformation and IT organizational transformation. And if you can use the enterprise hybrid cloud to affect these transformations, the benefits are huge. How many of you would like to be excited to deliver a 24% reduction in your existing budget and also deliver the agility from self-service, chargeback, and full automation that can come from our enterprise hybrid cloud. Dramatic savings to your existing operating environments, money you can put into funding the growth agenda. Now, of course, whenever we put up a slide like this, I hear you saying, this is great, 
when can I have it? And we know the answer to that is right now. This cannot be a two plus year ERP type project, which is why we put so much effort into the EHC engineered solution to get you up and running in less than a month. And Josh will describe more about this as part of the keynote tomorrow. Now, one of the things we found is that one of the most fundamental ways that we can speed delivery of an enterprise hybrid cloud is to get you out of the components assembly business. Because how many of us in IT have time for this? And we all know the answer to this question, no, you don't. This is not creating a lot of value, putting these systems together and building your own infrastructure. So we find that the best way to implement an enterprise hybrid cloud is to use a foundation of converged infrastructure. But just like storage, where you'll hear people saying that they're one size of CI fits all use cases, we believe that is also flawed thinking. So let's talk about EMC's converged infrastructure strategy, including why we're so excited to have VCE now fully inside the EMC family. Converged infrastructure provides incredible value from speed, but it's more than that. Our customers who deployed converged infrastructure also find the infrastructure is more reliable, it's more efficient, and it's more agile. Said a different way, customers have a rock solid infrastructure they can trust and they can focus their efforts on the apps and on the business. That is the true promise of deploying CI. So how can you get to a converged infrastructure outcome? Well, let me walk you through the landscape today. So converged infrastructure started with reference architectures, and these continue to deliver great value to our customers. The EMC vSpecs program allows our partners, many of whom are in the room today, to build and deliver converged infrastructure via reference architectures that we've defined. You can think of these reference architectures as well-defined recipe books. Five years ago, EMC, with Cisco and VMware, pioneered something called the vBlock. A vBlock is a family of engineered converged infrastructure with a single point for support. vBlocks are configured for specific customer environments, and they're delivered from our factory to the customer, ready to load applications the same day. With the vBlock, we defined a new category, and today, vBlocks are the clear market leader in converged infrastructure systems. And as you know, and this is why we were so excited late last year, EMC acquired VCE, and it's now a full member of the EMC information infrastructure family. Now, as converged infrastructure has become mainstream, we're seeing a new category of what's called hyperconverged systems emerging. Hyperconverged converged infrastructure is based upon commodity servers, commodity storage components with a software-defined architecture. And today, these are predominantly focused upon departmental workloads delivered as an appliance. And this year, we introduced the EMC vSpecs Blue Appliance, designed and supported by EMC, delivered by our partners, and based upon the VMware Evo Rail technology. So today, we have blocks and we have appliances. But customer expectations have continued to evolve. And many of you have been asking us for the simplicity of a hyperconverged appliance at data center scale. Because today's hyperconverged appliances are great for smaller deployments, but they struggle to deal with the scale and workload diversity of the data center. And we believe there's a requirement for a new class of truly scale out data center hyper-converged systems, a new class. So today, we are proud to announce an industry first, the industry's first data center scale hyper-converged infrastructure, the VxRAC family. VxRAC is an engineered system, just like a vBlock, and delivers massive scale with a full VCE customer experience. VX racks are designed and supported by EMC and they incorporate EMC and VMware software defined technologies. 
So these are our converged infrastructure systems. Think blocks, think racks, and appliances, a full family. And now to tell you more, it's my pleasure to introduce Praveen on stage, the CEO of VCE. Praveen, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you up here. Absolutely. Welcome. Thank you. So Praveen, we've talked a little bit about converged infrastructure. Yep. Let's start off with um, discussing a little bit about why customers find CI so compelling today. Yeah, David, you talked about the tremendous amount of change that's happening in IT today, and business models are changing, technologies are changing. So if you're an IT practitioner, the number one problem you're dealing with is primarily how do you deliver this next generation IT infrastructure while handling the tremendous amount of complexity? So the answer to that question really was about converged infrastructure. That's how we, that idea came about. So over the past five years, we worked with our customers to be able to deploy converged infrastructure as a core foundational building block of the data center. And because these systems are pre-engineered and optimized to the customer's requirement, it really allows you to deliver three key things. Right? The first is agility. So rapidly be able to deploy this next generation technology, get it up and running for business. The second is really highly available, high performance system optimized for tier one application workloads. The third key thing is really simple. It's, it's really a dramatic reduction in the operational complexity and the cost associated with the, that next generation IT infrastructure. So when you think about a combination of, of all of these, explains why VBlock today is the number one market leader and continues to basically set the pace in the marketplace. Now the other thing we're also doing is we're going to continue to invest and innovate on the VBlocks because this is our flagship platform. So you know, you think about some of the recent announcements we, we leverage the extreme IO technology to leverage to basically build a flash-based VBlock, the, the VBlock 500 series. Uh, we leverage Cisco's uh, Nex uh, Nexus 9000 switches with ACI to deliver the vScale fabric that allows VBlocks to connect within the data center as well as across data centers. And the most important thing that we're very proud of is we've, we've created the industry's first converged infrastructure management and orchestration platform, Vision, which is a foundational building block. So, you know, you combine all of these things with VC's great customer experience, which we are absolutely passionate about. Every single member of my team and myself get up every day morning thinking about our customer experience. It explains why VBlocks are where they are today. Super. And also, of course, uh, last but not least, we've built a multi-billion multi -billion dollar business together in just five years. So uh, yep. the adoption rate has been fantastic. So absolutely. that's the, the VBlock. And of course, there's one right behind you. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. People can see very that. Proud so of our very proud of baby. Okay, so that's great for me. Let's now move to um, hyperconverged appliances. Um, how are customers using them? This is now the appliance. And uh, what's so great about vSpecs Blue, which is quite new for us as well? Yeah, vSpecs Blue, I mean, it's right here on the stage here. I mean, uh, you know, if you think about hyperconverged, and you talked about it, you know, there's a dramatic amount of simplicity that hyperconverged appliances bring to the table. You think about you know, the compactness, the ability to get this thing deployed quickly. Um, and a lot of customers use this for departmental workloads. If you're an enterprise, you know, in a remote office, branch office type of use case. And if you're a small and medium business, basically applications which require, let's say, 100 virtual machines or, you know, 100 odd VDI sessions. So we launched vSpecs Blue. It's based on uh, VMware's Evo Rail technology. And it's really cool because it's fully software defined. And VMware has done an amazing job in terms of making it really, really simple to deploy. So this thing is out of the box, up and ready to go in 10 minutes. And you can stack about eight of these in a cluster. So it's, uh, it's one of the platforms. It's, what's really cool about this, though, is uh, we've created an app store that you can basically fire up when you, when you deploy vSpecs Blue. So you, you fire up the app store, you get access to a lot of VMC's enterprise class technologies, you know, data recovery, protection, backup, and such like, which essentially allow you to bring a lot of the enterprise class capabilities into this segment. So you know, we've, we, this is early days yet for vSpecs Blue. But we are absolutely committed to making sure this is going to be a premier hyperconverged appliance. So we're going to work with VMware. We're going to work with our partners. We're going to continue to refine our go-to-market. But make no mistake, this is going to be our baby in terms of the hyperconverged appliance market. Great. So really, the, the hallmark here is simplicity, right? It's yeah. designed to be quick to, uh, to operate, obviously very cost effective, but simplicity and speed absolutely. are the key benefits here. OK, so let's move on to today's exciting announcements, yep. right? the big announcement of the morning. Um, we talked about the VX rack. Tell us a little bit more about the VX rack. Uh, why do we think this is a new class of system? What makes it different from other hyperconverged appliances? Absolutely. I'm really fired up about the VX rack. I mean, this is something that 
we're so excited about because, you know, I, you know, we, I call them scars on the back, but you know, we've, we've generated a body of expertise over the past five years, deploying engineered systems at data center scale for our customers. So we've got to bring that expertise to the hyperconvert space, and that's really what the VX rack is all about. So let's do some show and tell. Let's do some show and tell. Okay. So, you know, Are you trained on here? this, Praveen? Is this safe? Oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the light came on. There you go. So this is a new... This is our new baby. Now, there are a couple of things here that are really cool. So as you can see, it's built on the hyperconverged building block. So essentially, you know, two RU units is based on Haswell technology. Now, one of the things that's interesting is uh, you can actually get multiple flavors of these building blocks. So you can get a compute-intensive node, or you can get a storage-intensive node. So it actually solves one of the fundamental challenges you have with hyperconverged, which is how do you decouple the scalability of compute with the scalability of storage? So you're able to mix and match these things mm -hmm. in the rack. The other important thing, and this is really important it's based on our experience, is networking is fundamentally contemplated as part of the VX rack. So you think about the physical aspect of it, right? You can take the, the top of rack switches, you can actually connect them into our vScale architecture, which, which we just talked about, Cisco's Nexus-based vScale architecture, and you can start to basically add multiple VX racks and scale out. Truly, you cannot really scale out unless you contemplate networking, and that's one of the things that we built in. The other thing that's important is our workloads that run on these platforms are you know, of a distributed nature, right? right? So they expect that they're going to have not only flexible computer and storage, but also flexible networking. And so the software-defined networking, again, is fundamentally a architectural building block of the VxRack. So these are a couple of things. And then when you think about the manageability aspect of it, right? So we're building a unified management and orchestration platform that's fundamentally going to incorporate a technology such as Vision, some of the key core, core technologies from EMC to be able to make it very simple for us to start to rack and stack these things and build a truly scale-out uh, hyperconverged system. Okay, so really a new class of hyperconverged is very different from the appliance. Uh, Absolutely. Aimed at data center and workloads and scaling. So, so primarily you can think of this as you know, tier two workloads, emerging applications that are fundamentally take advantage of the hyperconverged architecture as opposed to your classic so tier one data center style application like an ERP system which would run on a V block. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about scaling of a VX rack. Uh, how small can we start? How big can we go? Let's kind of give people a perception for kind of where these are really positioned. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one other thing I wanted to announce before we go to the scale aspect was we're going to actually announce two versions of the VX rack. Right, so if you think about this, you now we're going to have a standardized hardware configuration, right? A standardized set of building blocks, but we can basically uh, load the, the system with different software to be able to change the personality of the, so of the system. So the first is going to be based on EMC Scale IO uh, and a VMware, and gives you a choice of VMware as well as other hypervisors. So it's truly uh, leveraging the app attributes of Scale IO to be able to build a massively scaled-out system. So that's basically going to be orderable in the next 90 days. We're, uh, in the August time frame, we're going to announce the second version of, our, uh, of the VX rack, which is going to be entirely optimized for VMware environments. It's based on VMware's Evo rack technology. Again, so lots of cool stuff that VMware has done there in terms of the fully software-defined data center construct, management orchestration, really simple to use, uh, uh, ability to get this thing up and running very quickly. So two different versions, again, power, uh, of the VX rack, same hardware configurations, and going forward, we expect to launch more versions of these. So that's really different personalities. Way to think about it. Absolutely. Well, I guess I know how small it starts. Uh, it looks like it starts out of the quarter rack, Praveen. So where does it go from there? All right. So you can start quarter rack. You can go half rack. You can go full rack. And if you really want to, you can build this thing on out for thousands of racks. I mean, this is really truly scaled out. It contemplates. Software-defined storage, which allows you to be able to pool a lot of these resources across multiple racks and offer them in the application, the inbuilt networking. We really thought this through in terms of enabling a truly scale-out system here. So this is not something that you're going to have to go and engineer yourself. So massive scale um, can be connected through the vScale architecture for even bigger global scale if you want to build big systems and have Absolutely. them. Absolutely. It's a connection to the vScale architecture. And the other really important thing is the one thing we're very proud of is the VC customer experience. And as I said, me and my team really sweat this every single day. And we're going to be able to deliver this engineered system with the exact same customer experience that you've come to expect from a vBlock. 
So that's going to be, uh, I think, one of our key differentiators in terms of the way the system's going to get deployed. All right, so that's a really key point. I think that leads me to my last question. So I'm sure it's on people's mind. We've got VX racks, that's new. We've got V blocks, we've had those for five years. We said they're both engineered systems, right. and they're both for use in data center environments. So can you explain to everybody, Cal, what the differences are and what the customer use cases would be that they're optimized around? Yeah, and this is a really important question because you know, when you think about VBlocks, as we said, it is going to continue to remain our flagship platform. Now, we, we have a wonderful uh, opportunity here with the VBlocks. We have access to a tremendous amount of R&D from EMC, from Cisco, from VMware leaders in their technology spaces, and being able to bring those technologies and deliver them to our customers through the VBlock. So it's essentially going to be the foundation for our you know, mission critical tier one, highly reliable and resilient kind of workloads. The VX rack essentially is optimized for a different set of use cases, primarily focused on tier two applications in the data center. But you can also think of this as applications that are that take true advantage of the hyperconverged architecture, you know, distributed architectures, you know, some of the new evolving applications, such as mobile optimized applications. So that's really where we see the VX rack. Now, what's really important is a couple of things, right? One, you have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to basically interact with you as VCE to be able to bring you the full range of architectural platforms, appliances, racks, and blocks, and be able to focus on really solving the customer's problem as opposed to trying to figure out which architecture is the right one for you. And we're going to be able to deliver all of this with, as I mentioned, uh, something that we're very proud of, the VCE customer experience. So that's really what I think is cool about this. So that is great. Thank you, Praveen. Um, it's clear that you and your team are you know, the thought leads, the technology leaders in Converge infrastructure. We have defined the market. We now redefine the market. Look forward to your innovation. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Praveen. Thank, you. For Praveen. Thank you, everybody. Okay, quick drink of water. All right, so we talked about converged infrastructure. One of the things we've always believed is that converged infrastructure must be built upon best of breed technology. Um, you can build a converged infrastructure stack upon good enough, but that's not the way to go. And we pride ourselves and the foundation of our business inside of EMC information infrastructure is to have the best to breed in a full family of storage products. And a good analogy for what's going on here would be to take an example from the automotive industry. We could have picked any major car company, GM, Ford, Volkswagen, Toyota, but we picked BMW because they've got some nice looking cars, and so we're gonna use them as our example. So for the last 100 years, as we all know, gas engines have powered the car industry, uh, represents the majority of the auto industry today, well over 90% either gas or diesel powered. And you could consider this the platform two of the automotive industry. Now, in recent years, there have been some disruptive technologies like electric engines, which people are adding to platform two cars. They're creating efficiencies and better environmentals. And we would call these the platform 2.5 of cars. And by the way, platform 2.5 can be really cool. Some of these 2.5 cars are leading edge and very, very cool. And finally, we're seeing the emergence of a range of pure electric cars, many of which have been designed with a clean sheet, like the i3 here. They are architected fundamentally differently. They've got no combustion engine, and they've got no transmission. It's a new platform. And in many respects, they're a lot simpler. This would be the platform three of the automotive industry. And if we apply this concept to IT, we've got platform two and platform 2.5, and we've also got platform three. The one difference here is that for cars, all three platforms are focused on the same set of workloads, moving people or moving a family around. For the IT industry, the platform three technologies are really optimized for a new class of workloads, but the analogy plays pretty well. So I talked earlier about the platform 2.5 IT, and I talked about it when talking about the enterprise hybrid cloud. So let's explore that in just a little bit more detail. What is platform 2.5 in the IT industry? Platform 2.5 is about applying some key P3 platform-free technologies 
like standardized hardware, scale out, software defined self service, to platform two infrastructures and platform two apps. Think of it as creating the analogy of the hybrid car, but for the platform two workloads. And you can think of VX Rack as essentially being our first important, but also a platform 2.5 announcement today. But today, we have plenty of other exciting announcements, starting with the next major revision of Extreme IO 4.0. Now, some have nicknamed it the beast, so ignore it, ignore it if it growls for a while, just ignore that. Um, Extreme IO has come from no revenue to market leadership in just 18 short months. And if you haven't read the latest Gartner market share report that came out last week, I recommend you take a look. Extreme IO is the clear market leader by a long, long way. And there's a good reason for this. Um, because in the all flash array marketplace, architecture matters. And one of the fundamental reasons, apart from our great customer relationships and service and support, is that the Extreme IO is architected differently from other all flash arrays. It is uniquely scale out, and all of our data services are in line all the time. Two fundamental differences from every other all flash array on the market. And by the way, for those of you who were here this time last year wondering about the million dollar guarantee, I can assure you it remains unclaimed as of today. Today, we're also announcing a major new release of the VMAX 3 software platform. This release makes the VMAX 3 a true data services platform that can sit in front of any class of storage. It can sit in front of native VMAX storage or other storage arrays or even the cloud storage as a services platform, which we'll talk about later on this morning. And you may remember we announced a complete re-architecture of the VMAX family last J July. Not only did we make it bigger, faster, and denser, we made it a massive workload consolidation engine, but we also announced something called Protect Point. And Protect Point promises to change the world of backup forever. And this brings us to our next major announcement today. Today, we're also announcing the new beast of the data domain family, the data domain 9500. This replaces the existing data domain 990. And very simply, think of it as 2x everything, 2x the capacity, 2x the ingest rate at essentially the same price. A huge new refresh to the high end of this very successful family. And then on Wednesday, we'll be announcing new products and more than that, a new philosophy for EMC in the third platform. We're going to update you on Isilon. You're going to get sneak peeks to something called Project Caspian, the latest on DSSD and you'll see our continuing plans for software-defined storage and how this fits into the world of open source. I really encourage you to come to the keynotes tomorrow and Wednesday as well. And at the end of this week, as you reflect back, we are sure, and I hope, this is not your father's EMC. So let me summarize with a quick recap of our strategy. Our strategy in EMC information infrastructure is really quite simple. It starts off with a full family of best of breed storage products for platforms 2, 2.5, and platform 3 that are fully cloud enabled and they're automated by the Viper software suite. We have a full family, a full family of converged infrastructure solutions based upon this best of breed technology and catering for every workload enterprise, data center, service provider remote office, branch office, or small, medium business. In partnership with the rest of the federations, we've built a range of solutions that deliver the outcomes that will enable you to solve the major pain points that you as CIOs and your IT departments are feeling today. And by solving these major pain points, you can enable these key business attributes that in turn will deliver the experiences that the information generation expects and position your business to be a winner in the information generation. So before I leave, I want to leave you with one last thought. You know EMC as a technology company, and we think of ourselves as a people company 
in the technology industry. And a key part of our culture is giving back to the communities around the globe. And last year, we brought a little of this to EMC World with Charity Water. Who was here last year and did a charity walk? Can I see a, a raise of hands? Thank you very, very much. I want to close today by sharing a video of what happened after EMC World 2014 with the money that we raised through the charity walk. So I look forward to seeing many of, this, many of you this week. Thank you. Have a great EMC World. Thank you very much. Last year at EMC World, many of you did the water walk and you raised money for charity water. So this year, we've come out here more than a few. I'm going to show you where your money's at work and show you how you've been able to redefine the lives of thousands of people by giving them clean water. Less than 50% of the people in this part of Ethiopia had access to clean water. You just need to take one look at the water that they're drinking and you know it's bad. It's not even fit for animals in most cases. When a community gets clean water, they're going to be healthier. Their kids are going to go to school. Um, they uh, will have more time to spend with their families or working on their farm or working on a small business. Um, it has all sorts of impacts. It really changes life. Just in the last two years, EMC support has delivered clean water to almost 6,000 people in northern Ethiopia. It's a huge, huge difference for these people. Very cool. Hey, awesome. So, welcome, Scott. It's great to be here. Very, very pleased to uh, have you at EMC World, or have you back at EMC World. Mm -hmm. So last year, this audience, this awesome audience, did the water walk 6,000 yeah. times, and at EMC World and following on events, yeah. we raised over $300,000 in conjunction with Charity Water. Which is amazing. Which is incredible to bring clean water to the north. 6,000. 6,000 people in Ethiopia. 6,000 people in Ethiopia. Extraordinary. So, you guys are a pretty unique organization. Some people might not be familiar with you. So, sure. you want to just talk a little bit about Charity Yeah. I mean, we, uh, we exist to make sure that no one in the world drinks dirty water. Uh, it's kind of amazing to be here, you know, sitting here talking about a connected world and 750 million people don't have clean water. And uh, a couple ways that we've tried to kind of reinvent uh, charity, we, we have always used 100% of the public donations to directly fund water projects. And you know, one of the main problems people have with charities, they don't know where the money goes. Mm -hmm. So we literally have two bank accounts, one for the public and uh, a small group of private donors cover the overhead. Uh, the second thing is just radical transparency. You know, we, uh, we want to prove where the money goes. You saw some of the plaques there that said EMC with unique IDs. Uh, every single charity water project is put up on Google Earth and Google Maps. You know, everyone in this audience with a $100 handheld GPS device could go and visit 16,000 wells around the world. Radical transparency. We think people deserve to know exactly the impact that their dollars are making. And uh, the third thing is that we work with local partners. You know, we're not sending Westerners out there. There are over 1,500 locals that are leading their own communities forward. Just in Ethiopia, where we're working with you guys, there's 400 people uh, drilling wells, hydrologists, technicians, trainers. So it's the locals helping their communities. That's awesome. So I know you spend a ton of your time personally <laughs> out in Ethiopia. Yep. I know you just got back. I think you've been there like 25 times or so. So yeah. can you just describe for a second, what's it like out there? Uh, you know, you saw a little bit in, in some of the video clips. I mean, you know, th this uh, is a video I shot. Women with, you know, leeches in their water. I mean, it's unthinkable. Uh, water we wouldn't give our dogs to drink. You know, we've put water under microscope and is literally alive. You know, it cells replicating. And some of these women are walking eight hours a day in the hot sun to bring water back to their families. It's not even clean. You know, I was, uh, I was with a woman recently uh, who told me she had ten children and eight of them died. Uh, so much from the water, you know, she's, she's pouring out brown viscous water. And I know there's so many, you know, parents in this room, I just became a new parent, unthinkable to see someone and think about giving it to a child. So what happens when you guys turn up? Yeah, so the good news is it's a solvable problem. Uh, Charity Water is solution agnostic, so we fund a lot of different solutions. What we've been doing with you guys is just drilling wells. For $10,000, you know, an entire community can get access to clean water. And, you know, there's a horrible irony sometimes to see hundreds of people drinking from swamps and ponds and 300 feet beneath them 
is enough water for thousands of people. And uh, for $10,000, you can drill a well, give an entire community clean water. And water, you know, we say at Charity Water, it changes everything. It impacts the health of people living there. It improves the education. You know, kids that aren't sick with diarrhea, schools that, that now have water. And one of the most remarkable things is the time given back to those women and girls. We'll hear incredible stories of small businesses. Many of them will become entrepreneurs and they'll sell rice or peanuts at the market earning a dollar a day. So water just has this you know, transformative effect on the lives of the poor. There, there's nothing better uh, to lift people out of extreme poverty. So this is a, a, an issue that at EMC we're really passionate about. As I said earlier, yeah. we raised $300,000 in 2014. We, we want to step the bar up. So this year, in conjunction with, with you guys, we, the goal is that we want to raise a million dollars, wow. half a million dollars through contributions from the activities we do, and half a million dollars matched by EMC. That's amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. So, so, I know lots of people also very passionate about this issue. So, people in the audience, how do they go sure. get involved? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things. We actually have a working well down at the village uh, that's attached to a sensor. You know, we're also trying to use technology to make sure these water projects are fun functioning and then let the donors know, you know that water is being provided. So you can go and pump the well, and I think it actually will unlock some of those donations. It right? does. The more water we pump, the more donations. Exactly. We so go check that out, learn about that in the village. And then the second thing, you know, we were talking about Charity Water uh, has been asking people over the last period of years to donate their birthday. Very simple idea that's helped us bring now over five million people clean water around the world. Uh, so instead of asking for gifts, you know, instead of throwing yourself a big party, you know, most we of us, really need. we don't really need anything else. You know, 750 million people don't even have their most basic need met. So we say skip the gifts and ask for your age in dollar donations. Okay. And it's, it's amazing. Seven-year-olds ask for $7, 35-year-olds ask for $35. We've had 89-year-olds go out and, and raise money for this. And we've actually created a link. Um, if anybody here wanted to pledge their birthday, we will be able to track the impact of EMC World over a year. Um, the average person, I know these, this group loves data, the average person raises $1,000 for their birthday. Probably need some friends. tape on this wire, though. I'm still all bundled. Check, check, check. Can you hear me? And it's from something as simple as a birthday. And it's $10,000 to put one of these new wells. $10,000, and I know some of your companies and uh, many of the vendors that were here actually stepped up and got their business involved. So, you know, just for me, a huge thank you to this community uh, for being so generous, for, you know, already changing 6,000 people's lives and, and doing even more this year. Here we go. Great check, check, check. You guys are awesome. Thank, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. It's on them. Now I see. Clip. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check. So we are talking charity water, we're talking technology, we're talking the cube, we're talking all kind of crazy shit. Because that's what we do. Compared to providing clean drinking water for everyone in the planet. All right, last half an hour. Let's get back That's what technology. we do. We talked about the information generation and what a lot of trouble this generation is going to cause for the IT department. You're going to hear a lot on Wednesday. We're going to be up here with CJ and Chad and Randy Bias. I'm going to talk a lot about the emerging technologies and how we build that new world. But I think David hit the nail on the head earlier when he said, look, today, the current set of workloads and applications, what we're really faced with doing is driving down the cost and the way we manage that application infrastructure. And to be fair, it's not just about cost reduction. Because I don't know anyone who is okay reducing cost if performance drops off or if availability drops off. People want less cost, but they want more performance. They want more availability. And they want a much more check, agile check. infrastructure. Check, check. Now here at EMC we have an entire we're talking division. Technology, we're talking EMC world, we're talking that charity water, guy, okay. infrastructure from guy tech to alumni described it earlier, working on his to brand. Check. And it's my great pleasure to announce the president of that division, the core technologies division, Guy Churchwood. Guy.
welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, so you got a big job in the last year because those of you that don't know, Guy was the backup guy, right? Kind of. Well last year. So now, I guess, so looking around the at new all one. these boxes, you're, you're the new hardware guy here at EMC. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I got, switch uh, keyboards for soldering items, right? Just like that. No, not really. I mean, actually, if you look at core technologies, which includes everything, less than 1% of our engineering. I don't know if you see, too, I got your, uh, your band-aids over there. Check, check, check. I got band-aids. I got, I got syringes. I got cotton swabs. I got alcohol. I got... And so, I mean, I also notice, I mean, you've got a lot of products here. I mean, you've been at this, you know, six months now. I thought you would have been able to consolidate these down to one. Yeah. Yeah, I really want to give you an expletive, really want to give you an expletive at this point, but I'm not allowed to, because um, Joe's in the audience somewhere, otherwise I would. Uh, you know, I, I looked at it because of, obviously, with VMAX and VNX and Extreme IO, and in the block market, they're kind of going after the same workloads. Uh, and I'm a big car guy, so I can't use that analogy because... Already done. Yeah, and he broke all my news, so I've got a bunch of slides I can't use now. But anyway, I, I'm also a camera guy. And so I was sort of looking at it, and I've got a couple of toys up here. Blog, if anybody wants to read it, I can't go into full detail, but this is a digital SLR. You know, in other words, if you, if you saw the, the new baby, the raw baby, they're using this, and right. not an iPhone. This is actually my mirrorless that I camera you all the time, right? So this goes everywhere, and then I shouldn't have it on stage, but my iPhone, which actually Flickr have just said is the second most popular camera brand in the world. Huh. So the thing is, they all take photographs. Yeah. So can one replace the other? Or do they all have a need? So in other words, everything has a pocket. You just have to understand what it's trying to do. So, so, so again, now you've explained our strategy to the three people in the audience who subscribe <laughs> to Amateur Photographer. <laughs> um, let's yeah. zero on. I mean, these all have flash in them. Yeah. OK, so flash in and of itself, is that the disruption here? No, I mean, you know, we mentioned about cars. I think Tesla was kind of brought up briefly. It's not the battery that makes the Tesla. It's actually the combination and the marriage. So it's actually software with the, the hardware itself. So everything kind of has flash, but you really have to understand how to use it and how the software basically plays and interplays. And Extreme IO, yeah. the flash product of the moment, so to speak, uh, give us a little bit um, of what's up in Extreme IO land. Oh, and by the way, that's... Been successful. So, so my bizarre thing is that's my Extreme IO because it's not your dad's thing and it's actually rock and roll. This is actually my VMAX okay. and this is my conversion hyperconverged. Ah. So that's how the blog works just in case you don't bother reading my stuff. Um, so it is about the architecture and it is about having the data ser services online all the time. So one, the, you know, there's, a, there's a guy, wonderful guy, and I, he's in the audience maybe, a herd who runs our Extreme IO business. And he said to me, we didn't build a an AFA to compete with standard arrays. We build it to be the best AFA in the world. And that really was to make sure that we have high performance, we have low latency, but we actually can have all the data services turned on all the time and the performance isn't impacted. And that's the magic. And, and it's been only 18 months since release and it, Extreme IO has been on a tear. Yeah, so I mean, the, the good news is if I, if I kind of look at it in the chart we have here is data domain is also in my portfolio, it's doing a fantastic job and this was a very fast rocket ship. And then if you look at VMware, that was a fast rocket ship. This product's actually going, you know, hyperstellar. So it's really doing the job for us. And we believe that this will be well on track for a billion dollars. So, yeah, it's, it's market changing. So, so our fastest product, but potentially fastest grown product in history. Yeah, and, and from an AFA perspective, just, I think David mentioned it, uh, Gartner just published a, a report. We're over 30% market share on it. And this is the first year of shipping, and we've shipping, and we've got at least 10 points gap on anybody else. Fantastic. Love to hear you talk about this stuff. Love even more to hear from customers. So I think after the short video, we're going to hear from Xerox, who's with Jonathan on the remote stage. Wonderful. You probably know Xerox is the company that's all about printing. But did you know we also support hospitals using electronic health records for more than 30 million patients? Or that our software helps over 20 million smartphone users remotely configure email every month? Or how about processing nearly $5 billion in electronic toll payments a year? In fact, today Xerox is working in surprising ways to help companies simplify the way work gets done. And life gets lived. With Xerox, you're ready for real business. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gary Tomorrow from Xerox. Hey, great to have you here. So we, we've got to know each other a, li a little bit over the last couple of days, but why don't you just share a little bit with the audience who might be not so familiar with Xerox or what 
Xerox is as a company and a little bit about your role. Outsourcing organization. Mike. Uh, and try again. Scramble, scramble. Always what you want, just on a main stage. All right, we're going. We're going. We're going for analog technology. All right. Old technology, sure. Uh, my role is the Vice President of Document Outsourcing uh, for our uh, largest uh, outsourcing component, our three point, uh, th still not working? Yeah, it is. We're good? Yeah. We can start again. Um, right. Vice President for Global Service Delivery for our three plus billion dollar document outsourcing business. Um, we're recognized in the industry, Jonathan, as the leader in the management services business um, by both Gartner, IDC, and Forrester, so we're really big really the biggest on the planet. And just to give everyone a little perspective of how big that is, we have 15,000 service delivery professionals globally. We support annually over 8 million incidents and service requests a year. We monitor remotely, and a little bit of kind of like I always call it the air traffic controller module, is about 1.2 million network devices. And we support for our clients 16 million end users globally. So when I say big, it's big. And we have 12 global delivery centers that span the globe that we support in an air traffic controller mode. Money. All right, so big companies are great, but sometimes big companies come with big problems, mm -hmm. and I knew you, you had a whopper. Yes, our, our data growth was over 25% annually, and our disk space just wasn't keeping up our infrastructure with the business. We were having timeout latency challenges globally, and I was sharing with you a story the other day I think uh, most people in the, in the audience will probably relate to. I was on an uh, international Asia-Pacific business review with our service delivery leaders. And I looked at the agenda. And I, they had a tour of one of our delivery centers put on the agenda. And I was like, oh, that'll be interesting. You know, a tour, get to meet the people, shake hands, see what's going on. Didn't realize when I went into the delivery center, there was a secondary message that was going to be presented. Is the leaders took me up to some of the agents at the help desk, and they sit there, and the agents start to go through their queues. And there's actually watches to time how long it takes them to log on and go screen to screen. Horrible. 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 Wasn't a good trip. Not a good trip. So not, you, not, not the intent of the trip at the auto. You were becoming really like one of the most popular guys in, in, in Xerox, but probably for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Right. Probably the wrong reasons. Popular for a reason of productivity and some client challenges we were having. So lots of meetings. We ended up having exception reviews all the time, weekly, you know, weekly meetings to try to get through our challenges and, and try to get back to where we needed to be. Okay, that's awesome. So you had to do something. Your life kind of sucked at that point. So what, what did you decide to go and do? Well, we, we know we needed to transform. You know, with as big a business as we had, we started a transformational project team trying to look at different solutions and different ways to approach the business. Um, so that happened at the end of about 2013. We formed this um, very senior uh, uh, project team. And the team went through defining where the business was headed, where we were going to be in you know, two to five years, and came up with a uh, strategy to invest in Flash. And it was targeted at improving our latency by 1 AM MS. And that's what we were looking for is productivity. So the only solution we came up with was EMC's Extreme I.O. And um, it began in probably mid-2014, and we migrated into the new solution in October of 2014. Okay, so you completed about six-ish months ago, six, seven, eight months ago. So what, what's been the, the impact or the results of, of that transition? From an IT perspective, it's changed our lives. Um, but to me personally, from a business perspective, um, we've gotten 30% productivity. So when I mentioned 15,000 service delivery professionals in delivery centers, pulling reports for clients, billing, all those type of things, 20% productivity or 30% productivity, 20 times faster response time, and personally, no escalations. I haven't received one senior escalation from any of the regional geographies since October of 2014, and our weekly meetings are now no longer even conducted, we're back to normal business process. That's awesome. So you're happier, the team's happier, your wife's happier, everybody's happier. happier. Everyone in the business is happier right now. All right.
So we're obviously always trying to do more things for, for our customers. Mm -hmm. If, based on your experience with Extreme IO, if we were to do one thing more for you, what, what would that be? Yes, well, what we need you to do is double capacity. So you need to double capacity. Double capacity. All right, I think we might have something fantastic coming Excellent. for you right next. Thank you so much, Thank Gary you. from Xerox. <laughs> And I thought you were the beast guy. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> all right, so it's great to talk about all the past and what Extreme IO has done, but the big news today, Extreme IO 4.0, nicknamed the beast. Yep. I know that we've got some beastly features in there. You're seriously enjoying this, aren't you? He's getting impatient. What, guy, tell us your favorite features in 4.0. So, uh, yeah, I'll just I'll click onto them. If, if I, well, I will click onto them. There you go. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. Uh, so, online expansion, fabulous. If I look at uh, uh, non disruptive, so again, in the same vein, from my old world saying I'm the backup guy, I was a data protection. So, uh, integration with RecoverPoint. And then we've expanded on the copy data management. So, we're actually enhancing the way in which we do application services. So, again, all of this is around the software, but also with the software enables us to scale the beast. So this architecture that we've been, this architecture is getting upset over there. In fact, you know what? I can't stand it any longer. Uh, let, let's go uh, uh, pay a visit. Come on. Are we going handy cam? We are. We are. Hey, so. Um, Shall I just follow you? You just follow me. Are don't, you going to be don't, talking? Don't get too close. Um, this Extreme IO 4.0 software, um, who, is it expensive? Who gets it? Well, it depends on who you want to give it to, really. Well, I mean. Yeah, I mean, everyone who's bought Extreme IO, they get a free upgrade to the 4.0? Yep. All right. So here we are at the, the cage of the beast. He's sleeping. This is a pretty big box. It's probably not the software box. So there's probably more to the 4.0 release than just software. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is definitely not like, uh, you know, packaging with UPS or something. Okay, because what we're announcing today is not just Extreme IO 4.0 software. We also are announcing the 40 terabyte x -brick. So our friends at Xerox earlier were saying what they really wanted was double the capacity. We are introducing a 40 terabyte x -brick. So really the beast is the combination Extreme IO 4.0 software times eight x -bricks. We can scale out to, to eight x -bricks times 40 terabytes. So why don't we unleash the beast here, see what we've got. All right, I was worried about what to expect here. If it drops, I'm running. By the way, if this breaks, it's been nice knowing you. Because <laughs> that is a legit heavy piece of metal. All right, so, so Guy, um, eight X bricks, 40 terabyte X bricks. Yeah. There's got to be some like beastly math behind this thing. So, so you want me to work through the math for you? Give us the, uh, you're the smart guy here. I'm just here to make you look good. All uh, right, you're the pretty guy then, right? <laughs> so on the beastly math, if I, if I go through what you just described, which is basically 8 times 40 terabytes, so that takes you up to 320. Yeah. If you then look at things like deduplication and compression at about a 6x, which is in the general range, you actually get yourself knocking on the door of a couple of petabytes. Now, now some people would say, yeah, but look, out of the 40 terabytes, it's not all usable. You know, and also that 6x on data efficiency, that's aggressive. You know, you do the math, it doesn't matter. If you half this, it's still amazing. If you this, it's absolutely extraordinary. All right, so what we're saying is petabyte scale system. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. 
performance. And if you look at it, it's not just about performance. You actually want to make sure that, you know, out of the capacity, let's say, you have high speed. So if you do the other math, which is, you know, looking at the 8 times 2, you've got 16. You multiply that on a read writes, the normal workloads you have in a mixed workload, you're actually about 1.2 million IOPS. You know, and if you want to go hero math, which a lot of people like to publish, it's going to be around the 2 million. So you're then looking at petabyte scale, 2 million IOPS, and actually all of that with a latency of less than a millisecond. So really, really consistent online all time. So, so now, you're just like these, uh, on the subject of cars, you're just like these big American, you know, kind of V8s. They're pretty good in a straight line, but they have problems going around corners. I mean, this is clearly fast, right? What, what about, like, availability? So uh, you want to test it? Go on, then. Go for it. So, all right. So l let's, let's play a little bit of a game here. I'll tee up an application that's run in a second. Okay, let's pull the application up. App, app, there we go. So, it's running on the beast. Okay, so this is a workload running on the beast. Yeah. Now, without using an expletive, why don't you just try and pull some shit out of it and see what happens? Um, I'll just leave you to do that. You don't think I know how to do this, do you? But I, I, I doubt you know how to pull the bezel off. All right, here we go. How are you doing? It's, unfortunately, it's still running. <laughs> You're thinking a little bit like you need to think like an engineer. Go on then. You're not going to like that, are you? Do you want to do it? Oh, shit. <laughs> like it. Like it. <laughs> oh. oh, I can't hear a thing. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> oh, guy. Uh, well, you know, you know, the bad news is I thought my pulling drives out was going to bring it down. Yeah. I was almost certain that your stick of dine out was going to bring it down. Application's still running. I don't, I don't get it. Well, so I kind of knew that was going to happen. You know what I mean? Part and parcel of it is we actually have a mission critical lab, so we test these things extensively. And, you know, we've got to make sure one is this has got great reliability inside the frame, but you have to go outside the frame as well. So in the spirit of the power of the portfolio, we actually have VMAX, uh, sorry, the VPlex product, so we have a, another beast that's hidden away down in the data center, it's actually on the show floor, okay. and running the application. So we've got Extreme IO with VPlex and Recover Point. Yeah. So that's the benefit of having a portfolio. Exactly. Okay, so let's uh, flip back to slides. Speaking of the portfolio, I know we've got some other good stuff going on right over here. And if you like, the you know, daddy of the portfolio uh, is the VMAX. And the VMAX has changed a lot over the years, right? I mean, it really does look a little bit different. I mean, if we take a look, you know, this is the VMAX circa 2015. I mean, really, not your father's symmetrics. I mean, don't, don't those new cabinets just look absolutely amazing? If you cast your mind back to 1992, you might remember this is what the VMAX looked like. And I was doing a bit of research because you've changed a bit as well. <sighs> This is Guy Churchwood, circa 2015. Debonair. And this is what he looked like in 1992. Oh, <laughs> and for the EMCers, nobody's ever seen Guy with hair. And I am reliably informed that in this shot, you actually worked in sales, which explains the suntan. Yeah, and I had a golf, I had a handicap of less than 10. <laughs> well, so the, it, it really has been quite a transformation for the VMAX. And I still think to this day, I think most people here don't fully understood the extent of the changes that we've made. I mean, you know, g give us a little bit more insight. Yeah, so I was kind of working through this because we really did provide this uh, uh, data services. This is a classic way of looking at uh, VMAX, a VMAX 3. You know, and a VMAX is really about that reliability, the availability. So people think SRDF, they think TimeFinder. You know, what we did late last year was we actually introduced as an additional data service is Protect Point based with data domain. Yeah, so this, I mean, as David said, change the game of backup forever, no backup server required. Yeah, exactly. And I think over here, we've got a new data domain box. Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually a replacement for the top end system that we have. So this is actually the 9500. 
So this, if you like, would be the, the beast of the, of the data, ma data domain world. Yeah, you notice this one's not growling, it's just kind of gently purring under here. It's an understated beast. Exactly, it's a, it's um, a gentle beast. It's a guy, data domain, I mean, this has been a phenomenal product. I mean, I know you've had the pleasure of running that team. Um, are we still ahead of the competition here? Yeah, we are. I mean, the, the thing is, uh, with data domain, we always think of it as storage of last resort, you know, and, and we really internalize that, so this thing has to be rock solid. And so we don't want to push the boundaries too far. We have to get it right. But if I kind of look at the, the competitive landscape with ourselves, the box that we've just come out with is one and a half times faster than anything that's on the market. And in a single system, as opposed to multi, you've got four times the capacity. And again, it's down to the architecture. So we talked architecture in Extreme IO, architecture in VMAX, and the architecture we have with data domain enables us to do that. So the innovation's huge. Yeah. What you see in the, is the 1.6 and the four times, but the changes that they're making are mm -hmm. enormous and making sure that we still have that storage of last resort. So after all these years, really still setting the high bar. Phenomenal, phenomenal practice. product, phenomenal team. All right, so, so um, great diversion uh, to data domain. Let's get back to, to VMAX. All right. Um, you talked about Protect Point, one data service. What else have you been up to? Yeah, so this was kind of the, the area that I was looking at is, when I took over, was the VMAX 2 and the VMAX 3 the same thing? Is it your dad's VMAX? And, and they beat it into me that this is really a separation of data services from the back end, so brains and brawn. So you have the data services, and then you can encapsulate any storage underneath, which was kind of similar to my camera analogy you don't care for, because the lens is really the data service, but you can plug that onto other bodies. And in the same way, is you've got inside of VMAX, you can have SSDs, you can have hard drives, but you can also say third party or cloud, or in fact, even things like Extreme IO. So let me get this right. So fast, you know, storage tiering, which worked across different drive types within the frame. Now you're saying you can have essentially non-native backends. Right, and that's basically what we're bringing to market, so, which is FastRx. So if I look inside here, I'm almost scared to look in, inside <laughs> here these days. I'm so worried. <laughs> I don't know what, um, hold on, let me just, let me just. It's safe. Okay. We won't just see the standard VMAX backend. You'll see a couple of things, uh, an Extreme IO. Yeah. And also an EMC Cloud Array. Yeah. So super high performance backend, you know, kind of super uh, efficient uh, backend for, for cold data, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so one thing comes to mind, right? You've got different data services. You've got different backends. This is starting to get really complicated. Yeah. I'm a bit worried. I mean. How is this to manage? Yeah, I mean, and the team's really thought hard about that. So two things they did which were phenomenal. One is separating the back from the front end, and the other one is looking at saying, can you make it as easy to provision storage as like a fifth grader could do it? So what they did is they actually introduced an SLO-driven uh, topology SLO management. service? Surface level objectives. Okay. So and you uh, abstract it away from a lot of the detail to make it much easier to manage? Yeah, because every customer is moving towards the cloud. They might want to be a cloud themselves, so they want provisioning, deprovisioning really simply. So they've added that layer into their gold, silver, bronze, platinum. Um, so now you said so easy a fifth grader can do it. Yeah, as long as they're smart. You're going to stand by that? As long as they're really smart. Because I happen to have a fifth grader handy. Where's Henry? <laughs> All right, Henry, are you a fifth grader, first of all? Yes, I am. And just to prove that, how old are you? 11. 11 years old. This is Mr. Churchwood. Try not to get too close. <laughs> um, so, Henry's a fifth. Henry, what do you know about VMAX 3 service level objectives? Nothing. Nothing. Are you sure you know nothing? Mm, a lot. All right, what do you know about Halo? A lot. A lot. Okay, you should be fine. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a challenge. Henry is going to uh, use our service level objectives uh, uh, through Unisphere, and he's going to go and provision some storage. And he's going to set a time. And this same demo is going to be in the exhibit hall. And the number one time for the week will win Henry's favorite V cabinet, which is a VMAX cabinet all decked out to store AV equipment. All right, so you've seen the V fridge. This is the V cabinet. So Henry, are you ready for this? Yes. All right, let's go. All right, first of all then, um, let's, let me just see if the screens have flipped over. And I think what we should also get up on the screen is we're gonna need uh, a stopwatch. Now, again, what Henry is gonna do, he's gonna go and create a gold level of storage. He's gonna provision it. A workload's gonna run. 
he's going to go back and he's going to escalate the service level from gold to diamond. I thought that would be, you know, probably pretty simple for a fifth grader. So Henry, you ready? We've got the clock up on your marks, get set, go. There he goes. He may not know VMAX, but... He's not your child, is he? Clearly not. Certainly brain and skip you. Don't, when, 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 and, and parents, don't ever say to your kids that video games can't teach you anything. Stop. You're done. All right, so... <laughs> Henry. That's a new record. 20.46 seconds, that is awesome. All right, Henry Burton, everybody. All right, so Guy, I said would he stand by it, and he would. I mean, imagine this, you know, the VMAX has been always powerful. It's sometimes not always been the most easy to manage, but a great amount of work by the team to do the service level objectives. And clearly, you know, evidence shows a fifth grader can get after it. Yeah, and, and you think about it, we're, we're to continue journey. We want to do this across our portfolio, which is why you are putting the divisions together, and we've, we've collected the way we are. All right, so wrapping up. Um, you cannot move in the IT industry now without talking about cloud. Right. Our portfolio is no different. Uh, we made a bunch of acquisitions last year, Twin Strat, Imaginatics. What have you been doing with those acquisitions? So, so I'll, I'll quickly dive through them. Uh, from a uh, Twin Strata, uh, let me just skip through this. There we go. From a Twin Strata side, we've actually announced the cloud array, which allows you to push from a VMAX, in fact, any of our arrays out into cloud. Doesn't matter whether it's public or private. We saw it right in there a second. Yeah, it was actually exactly in there. So, so in that same philosophy, we also did a couple of other acquisitions last year with the Imaginatics and Spanning. But on the Imaginatics side, we're actually pleased to announce that we've done Cloud Boost, okay. which enables us to take both Networker and Avamar and push them in the same way out to any cloud. Uh, so again, it's great for people that don't, don't need that flexibility. So, so primary storage and, and uh, now backup and, and on the cloud layer, who do we support? Yeah, so once you get applications into the, you know, in other words, into the cloud, you want to figure out how to do that. And we did a, a bit of a longer range acquisition as a company called Spanning and they do cloud to cloud backup because you can't always rely on the cloud to do it. If you have two data centers, why wouldn't you do it in the cloud? And so basically they did Salesforce, they did Google Apps, and we're actually announcing the fact that they're now doing Office 365. So major applications, cloud to cloud backup with the Spanner okay. guys. So whether it's moving data to the cloud or whether we're doing backup in the cloud, we've got our bases covered there. Exactly. All right, so we talked about Extreme IO, we talked about VMAX, we talked about RecoverPoint, we've talked about VPlex, we've talked about our cloud strategy. The thing that's missing, you haven't mentioned the VNX. Oh, yeah. So. Um, and interesting enough, I mean, this is obviously the workhorse that we have, right? And I think last quarter we did 1,292 net new customers came into EMC through this brand, which is really cool. So I did have a little thing that I'd mentioned before you kicked me off the stage. Um, one is obviously we've just uh, got VVNX through the door. And the other one is, out of these customers, one of the clients that we're, we're, we're actually proud of is U2, the band that you might have heard of. Yeah, I've heard of them. Okay. Uh, so their new tour that's coming up, which is the Experience Tour for 2015, is actually going to be based around the, the VNXE product. And, it, and it's not any old VNXE? No, it's actually an all-flash VNXE. Okay. So, so really happy with those. And these actually, if you've got the pictures up, these are the flight cases for uh, delivery to them. Okay, so I think last year we talked about you know, the Vatican and the Pope and, and God himself being the first customer for ECS. We've now added you two to our notorious uh, customer list. We have. All right, have. fantastic. Uh, Guy, thanks for the whistle stop tour. Thanks for nearly blowing my eardrums up earlier. Ladies and gents, this is Guy Churchwood. He runs the Core Technologies Division. Guy, thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, guys. So that is a wrap for our day one general session. We're going to be back tomorrow with Federation Day. So let's roll the video to give you a taste of what you're going to see. Same time, same place. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., don't miss Federation Day with Joe Tucci, Chairman and CEO of Nielsen Federation.